There are few pieces in the piano repertoire that have had an impact as big as Chopin's first ballad in G minor. Thousands, if not millions of people have been touched by this piece of music throughout the years because somehow it strikes a special note of feeling personal and vulnerable and it also transforms that feeling into intimate tenderness, to glorious triumph and finally to passionate despair. And what's special about it is the way it fits together and how all the parts are connected because every section grows so gradually and organically out of the old. So there are clearly different sections but very unclear boundaries between them. And these shifts are significant and powerful and they are what makes the ballad so potently narrative in character, although without any explicit drama. Let's start by going through the form so you'll see what I mean and then I'll do a detailed analysis later. So we've heard the intro, very powerful. sets the tone. Um, it grows quickly, we reach the first theme. This slow waltz in D minor, kind of memory of a waltz, nostalgic. Uh, it goes on for a while and we get an important motif later on. Uh, this place. So this is part of a change, as you notice. But this is an important uh, uh, motif. I call it the closing motif. It's going to return. Uh, we get a transition. some nice arpeggios and then we reach the second theme. I'm going really quickly through it but I'm going to do the detail analysis later. Now we get a completely new character that grows from this. Lovely, lyrical, kind of like a nocturne in major, very reassuring. But after a while we get the return of the first theme, but now it sounds like this. Very spooky, the pedal point, and like heartbeats. Uh, almost uncanny. There is some real tension, but this time it overcomes it and we get the return of the second theme, but now it sounds like this. So you remember the nocturne like? Now it's totally transformed, it's in a new key, but still the same melody. <laughs> Triumphant. All this energy is kind of transformed to velocity. <laughs> and so on. And we reach kind of a middle section, developmental part. Uh, scherzando, again, completely new character. This is like a almost joking, uh, everything is fine, a jolly character. And remember this closing motif that I mentioned after the first theme in G minor. This motif is the foundation for this part. It's a variation, completely different character, but it's connected. Get some more nice runs, pianistic um, feast. And then we get a second return of the second theme. Again, fortissimo. And once again, this gives way to a return of the first theme in the spooky version.
and now we're starting to go back to G minor. We start in G minor and then everything that happens that grows goes through different keys. We have the second theme in B flat major, and then we go to E major, A major, then back to E flat major, B flat major, and here we uh, approaching G minor. So we feel the arc of coming back. This is the final return of the first waltz theme. This time it's like it can't overcome the pressure, so it doubles down. And we get the famous Furious Coda. Etc. We'll get to all the details of the whole piece in the analysis, but I'd just like to read a passage by Charles Rosen from his book The Romantic Generation about Chopin and the ballads. The fusion of narrative and lyric in the ballads is perhaps Chopin's greatest achievement. He realizes in music one of the major ambitions of the romantic poets and novelists. It is largely for this reason that classical criteria of form apply so awkwardly to the ballads, although we cannot entirely dismiss them as the composer was still working with them, or, more interestingly, against them. The ballads are in narrative form, but without a program. If there ever was a program that inspired them, it is no longer relevant for their understanding. There is no narrative sense of opposition and developing struggle. The narrative form is filled by a lyric content. The movement of the ballads is that of a story, an old story in verse with a refrain, but there are no events, only elegiac expression. This was Chopin's individual solution to the pseudo-problem of romantic program music that Schumann, Liszt and Berlioz fretted over. So, it starts with this declamation, like calling attention to the piece, big low C octave. Forte, largo is slow, pesante is heavy or weighty, but it's a bit unclear, like what key it's in. Because it could be C minor, but then, a flat, that's a major chord. So it's not minor. And it continues up in major. But somewhere around here it doesn't feel major anymore. So this F sharp kind of hints about the G minor tonality. Uh, we come down in dynamic, and it's a break, and then it's an answer to the big statement in piano. Like searching, again landing on D, longer pause, like what's going on? And then So we're gonna get a cadence here. C minor, that's a four, then G minor with D in the bass, and D7 to G minor. I'm just playing this to show the cadence, but I'm missing one note. Am I not? Yes, <laughs> this famous chord. So it, it's the D, um, G minor with D in the bass. So a dominant 6-4, but like an extra E flat. I don't really know what to call this chord. It's super dissonant because of the D to E flat. You can really savor it for a whole bar. And then lift the pedal. And now starts the main theme. So it starts as part of the resolution of the cadence. This is already how it's glued together. So before the cadence is, is resolved, we start the theme. So we, <clears throat> it's this slow waltz. Accompaniment is one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And the melody is long, simple, uh, long notes after the... Then the melody has to stop and think after each phrase. And start over. Stop and then start over. So this is like this old story refrain, a strophic uh, character. Also, it's always pairs of phrases. One, two, and then start over. 
But I'm just gonna get to the special character that we get from all of this, the memory of a waltz, slow, st stopping. It's a special mix of melancholy and nostalgia, and it's especially one chord in all this. And it's this one. It just creates that, that feeling. So, what is this chord? It's an A minor 7 minus 5. And it's on the second scale degree in G minor. So G minor, the second scale degree is A. And if we take a triad on A in a G minor scale, we get the diminished triad and if we add an extension to the seven, this is the normal tetrad, a four, four note chord you get on the second chord in a minor scale. So it's completely diatonic, but still it's very, like it contains it's both open and tense in the chord. It's open because we have this fifth and the seven, but it's also tense because we have the diminished the tritone. And yeah, it's just a magical chord. <laughs> and um, Chopin uses it to perfection to create this character. It then resolves again with the dominant to back to G minor tonic. Here it just goes to D major as the dominant and back. And then it takes another like a detour. By the way, the melody is flying up. Always nice octave lift. So we're going to B flat major and pale foam um, neighbor note the minor third to ma the major third in B flat major. Like, I think you can play, play out a bit here because it's so nice. You have, you've been really careful this, uh, yeah. But here you can do, it's so nice. But directly, it's the half diminished chord again. And we start over with the strophic phrases. Now, for is it the fourth time or something? We get a, a new chord. It's a G7 instead of G minor, so it points forward. And the melody goes on a little episode. I uh, get some longer lines. The left hand has some inputs. So here we get these longer lines and it gets like a, a warmer feeling, uh, more of a waltz because of the longer lines and, and don't stop all the time, but still with some painful suspensions uh, on top. This one, E flat to D, and now again. Here, it could be dominant to, to minor, that would be the uh, expected case, but of course, Japan surprises us, going to uh, A major in the first inversion, and again, so A major surprise again to F7. This harmonic surprises kicks off this lyrical embellishment in the right hand like a mini cadenza. And again going to the major, B flat major, and again straight back. To minor. I love these middle voices here. Chromatic. Hang on, now isn't this melodic fragment familiar?
Let's look at the very beginning, right where we get to the first theme after the introduction. It's the same. Kind of hidden in there, some other notes, but it's uh, tied, glued together. Anyway, now we get a new motif. And I call it the closing motif because it's like it's closing this whole section and starting the next section. But of course, nothing is ever properly closed. It's all fitting together. But anyway. So it's a rhythmic ostinato. You get a really nice groove, almost getting into a trance with this. It's strong beats on one and two of the three beats of every half bar. One, two, one, two, three. So it's like a, because all the notes come on the second beat, it's a bit of syncopation. And this is the contour. So I've hinted it's important for the rest of the piece. And it's different positions, all the chords, but it's the same contour all the time. Really emphasizing this contour as important. And amazing suspensions. Like the harmonies are not uh, like firmly, this is harmony, then the next, because it's always it's adding these notes on the top as suspensions and it's kind of morphing. <laughs> morphing to something else. But towards the end we feel a very strong harmonic direction because uh, it's a proper cadence after this C plus a 4 going to D, the 5, the dominant. Back to G minor. So this harmonic direction, it adds to this character of now it's crescendo and agitato and forte. So it's pushing the energy towards the next section. So this is one round of four bars. Now we get the same round, but it's a bit varied. The left hand configuration is slightly different. But the more important is this agitato, because we're going to end up in a higher tempo here, uh, pushing forward. Um, so we'll see what happens. So <clears throat> when we reach this, now we're getting like fast eighth notes, because this is like a higher tempo here, sempre più mosso it says. So now What's happened? Well, the rhythmic ostinato is the same. We have this strong beat on the first and second. One, two, three. But because the tempo is higher, uh, there are less strong beats generally. So it feels more light, lighter as a syncopation. Really groovy now. Uh, and Let's just go continuous eighth notes through all of it. This is still related to this important contour somehow. Like. Anyway, we get down here. Uh, vamp it for two bars. Now we get just pure arpeggios, no suspensions, that's the rest of the texture before. Just some nice runs for a long time. So D minor to the augmented plus 5 chord. I would say D plus 5 because it's the dominant but F sharp in the bass. Could be F sharp plus 5, they're the same notes. Back to G minor. And now, that's a nice surprise going suddenly to B flat major from this 
tenth chord to open B flat major with F in the bass. And it's thinning out, smolzando, calando, like dying away. And all that's left is this horn call. That's, that was the accompaniment middle voice. Just get a nice moment. Thanks for watching Sonata Secrets. A special shout out to my Patreon sponsors M. Valente, G. Edlund and F. Lemaitre.